From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper, and today on our show, we're talking about loneliness, which our Surgeon General recently identified as an epidemic. Then we're also going to talk about de-churching. Why is Gen X leaving the church? And what might that have to do with what we're asking of people? Lastly, we'll talk about rest and fatigue what that has to do with a recent TSA report, and with what it means to be human. Joining me today on the show are Bonnie Christian and Kirsten Sanders. Bonnie is CT's new editorial director for Books and Ideas. She's a longtime contributor to CT, and her work has appeared in The New York Times, The Week, and USA Today, just to name a few. Her most recent book is Untrustworthy, The Knowledge Crisis, Breaking Our Brains, Polluting Our Politics, and Corrupting Christian Community. Bonnie Christian, welcome to The Bulletin. Thank you so much for having me. Kirsten Sanders is a theologian and the founder of Kinesi Theology Collective. Her writing has appeared in CT, Mare Orthodoxy, and Comment Magazine. Her article, Why Church, was our March cover story earlier this year. Kirsten Sanders, welcome to The Bulletin. Thank you. A few weeks ago, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy issued a warning that loneliness is now an epidemic that the Center for Disease Control is warning about, is looking at. It's a contributor to a rise in all-cause mortality, not just deaths of despair, as one might imagine, but also deaths related to dementia, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Loneliness seems to be a correlated factor, at a minimum, with each of these things. It sparked a lot of different conversations, conversations about what role should the CDC have in talking about loneliness and how does this affect the rest of our life and our culture? And then earlier this week over at The Atlantic, Hillary Clinton published an essay on the weaponization of loneliness that has looked at the way loneliness is affecting our politics in particular. It's a fascinating essay. In many ways, it kind of reads like Hillary Clinton's greatest hits. It's kind of got everything from the you know vast right wing conspiracies to you know talking about Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh, but it's also talking about themes that have been very central to her platform in terms of thinking generationally, thinking about children, thinking about education. And so I wanted to pick up this conversation before we dig into too much about the kind of her substance and her solutions with just a general perspective on how we as the church are looking at and thinking about loneliness. Do we feel like this is an issue that the church is taking seriously and that the church is structured to deal with? Well, I think that it's a church issue insofar as it has to do with what it means to be persons. And Clinton treats it like a policy issue, I think, but the places where the peace is strongest is the places where she's trying to draw a broader vision or a more robust picture of what it means to be human. So insofar as the church's role is to help people realize what it means to be human in the shape of God's economy, I think it is an ecclesial issue, not a policy issue, though. I think we sometimes err when the church tries to mm-hmm. pick up strategies or solutions. Bonnie, how do you think about loneliness? You know, she's directly tying it in the piece to the rise of a certain kind of right-wing extremism. You know, from where you sit, do you see that as a fair connection to make? Is she broad enough? Is she too narrow? I think it is a fair connection to make, but I would say it is too narrow. It's interesting, at the conclusion of the piece, she she comes to this, you know, we need to break out of our toxic us versus them dichotomies and shrink our notion of the other and expand the we and we the people. It's this very, like, we're all in this together. But she comes to this right after, you know, what is, and understandably from, from Hillary Clinton, as you would expect, but very clearly politically aligned piece that is, is has some pretty clearly drawn lines of who is the other and who is the them that we're opposing. And so her characterization of sort of like the angry right-wing young man who is um, sort of the, the victim of loneliness and, and lashing out and, and getting into destructive and toxic politics because of his loneliness. I think there is some real truth to that, but I would push back on the idea that this is only a right-wing problem. I think this is something that's happening across the political spectrum and not to both sides it, but we're all in the same sort of broader cultural situation of being increasingly drawn into our screens and increasingly bad at staying connected in communal and institutional life. And so she's not wrong about how it plays out on in, you know, sort of ugly corners of, of the far right, but it's not only there. 
Yeah, it was interesting to me to see there's a moment in the essay where she talks about how we need to take a responsibility or there's a responsibility for the reader, I suppose, to commit themselves to, re she uses the language, restitch the social fabric. And she cites the work of a researcher named Raj Cherry, who says, you know, the social fabric, this was something that was formed in places like VFWs, church basements, and PTAs. And what's funny is you look at her solutions, and I think this is very much to what you were getting at. You look at her solutions, her solutions are not looking at the kinds of things that would make VFWs, church basements, and PTAs vibrant places. She's sort of calling people into political action. But yeah, nonetheless, I think it was remarkable to me to read it as this sort of call to arms for a policy and a political agenda that's very consistently off the shelf. I mean, she even kind of says, look, this is what I've been saying since the 1990s. And, and you kind of start to go, well, it hasn't worked yet. Like this hasn't, is, this solution hasn't caught hold yet. What, what are we missing? Is there something to your mind, Kirsten, that the church has to offer here? You know, obviously there are things that the church has to offer in terms of meaning and purpose and belonging that are fairly unique. And yet, we're going to talk about this more in a moment, the church is in a period of decline. Talk to me about, like, when you think about the way that people are disassociated from the church and the reasons people feel lonely and disconnected, what do you attribute as the cause to that? I think people misunderstand what it means to be human. And the role the church plays in that is that it ought to, through the worship of the church, remind us of who we are in relation to God that we're creatures and being a creature means that we're deeply dependent on each other and that each of us is the recipient of divine care and so deserving of neighbor love. It's hard. I think the the places where the Clinton piece on loneliness is the strongest, like I said, is the places where she speaks into what it means to be human, but you can't really legislate neighbor love and those sorts of things, concern for neighbor, concern for the other, thinking across the aisle, all of these things result from understanding of who we are as people, as humans, and how the relation we have to each other is theologically determined. So I think the church, when it is the church, recognizes that only here do we tell the truth about the world. Our version of what it means to be human is distinct. And it certainly results, I think, in social goods, but it doesn't need to announce itself as like, we have the problem. We have the solution to the problem of loneliness. Instead, we call people to different forms of life. Yeah, it came to mind to me. There's a one of the lines she mentions it twice in the in the essay, which is why it stuck out to me. She mentions barista unions in the essay two times as like positive signs that there's sort of life and meaning coming. And I had to laugh and roll my eyes because, again, like I said, the the essay sort of perfectly summarizes some of the sort of Clinton greatest hits, but it also sort of brings to mind how, as a politician, I think we often forget with someone like Donald Trump, for instance, Donald Trump knows exactly who he's talking to. And I think Trump understands his audience and doesn't care about trying to win anybody but his most rabid kind of followers, where I think there's a certain kind of progressive point of view. And I think Clinton is a representative of this, not the only one, where I think the effort to persuade often exposes a way of seeing the world that is not attractive to the people you're trying to convince. But it was remarkable to me in an essay about loneliness, how little talk there was of anything that would fit in the space of like a transcendent category, which is where I think we find the kinds of connections with other people are when we're looking for something that's a little bit more than, you know, than what a union can offer. Uh, loneliness is either like a, an ailment of the soul or it's not. But I struggle to think about how you could talk about loneliness as only a problem that could be solved through like a social problem. It seemed a little funny to me when the Surgeon General himself took up the problem, because it does seem to me to be a religious problem, or at least an existential one. You know, bowling leagues are derivative of the problem, right? Those are some of the places where people find belonging, like you said, but it's not the bowling that's solving the loneliness epidemic. Like you can't just get, you couldn't just solve it by delivering equipment, bowling equipment to like a small community. It's the sense of being part of something bigger than yourself, I think, that contributes the antidote. I think that's true, but I also, I don't know, I, I understand why this is the sort of thing that people are reaching for, right? So I, if you guys are familiar with 
um, the website Reddit. It's a, a forum website where people come in sort of interspace communities to talk about different things. And there's a big general purpose forum called Ask Reddit, where people just come and pose broad questions and thousands of people will answer them. And both there and in city specific forums, a really frequent question that people ask is like, how do you make friends as an adult, especially if you've moved to a new city? And the answer is always, it's predictable every single time. It's like, go on meetup and find a club, like find a, some sort of activity that you can do with people. Maybe it's volunteering, maybe it's some kind of sport or game and meet people through that. And what they're looking for is a place to regularly encounter the same people over and over again with some sort of shared purpose and interest. And of course, there's something that does that super well and it's church, right? But no one's going to mention church because it would be a little bit of a social faux pas on Reddit to, to pitch, pitch religion as the answer to your loneliness in your new city and, or in your adulthood. And I think that the same is true in these broader conversations and Hillary Clinton being sort of like the mainstream center left politician, you know, typified is going to go in this pattern. It would be a faux pas for her in her circles to say like, well, the, the, this institution that you're really looking for where this sort of relationship would have been built in years past, it is, it is actually going to services every week. And so she's looking for what are the other institutional locations where, because we don't have that shared assumption about religion, what are the other institutional locations where we can see people week in and week out? And it's work and it's, you know, labor organizing. And it's maybe if you hang out at the coffee shop and it's, you know, if you have some sort of hobby together, things like bowling. And so I understand why they're reaching for that because you do need that, like that built environment, like that place that you come back to week after week that increasingly doesn't exist and the church is not the default anymore. And so you, they're casting around saying like, what can fill that role? And this is what it, you know, it comes out to be. And so I think from our perspective, we look at it and say like, that's so obviously inadequate. It's a pale imitation of what you're getting in a healthy church community, but there's an underlying impulse there that is very intelligible, I think. I think so too. No, I totally agree with that. And I think there are certain secular means that provide something Similar, they do provide a kind of meaning that takes you outside of yourself and takes you out of, outside of sort of the polarized social echo chambers. And you can see how the barista union fits that, right? Because it's not just yeah. we're making coffee. It's this deeper purpose of like, we're providing good wages for our colleagues for whom we have affection. And so, yeah, I see why she goes to that as like an example, because it is going to be more meaningful. Like the union organizing is going to be more meaningful in that sense than many people's day-to-day -day jobs. Let me ask you this then, picking up somewhere where Kirsten left off, right? This idea that sort of if the church hangs out a yard sign that says, we will be your source for meaning and belonging and purpose, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, that kind of doesn't work. And yet at the same time, this is this thing that we have to offer is that there is meaning in faith and there is belonging in community. Do you have a sense of how the church could be talking about these things? Are we talking about these things? Are we advertising well for for what who we are and what we have to offer, Bonnie? I think yes and no. It's something that's difficult to communicate, I think, to someone who maybe hasn't ever had a positive adult experience of church. I moved two years ago and you know it took us a little while to settle into a church here. And then shortly after we did, we started we joined a, a small group that was just getting started. And I was struck because it had been a while, nearly a decade since I'd been in a new church. I was struck by how immediately intimate it is, how, you know, you're sitting down with these people that you've just met. You have no prior history with them, but you have these, these shared commitments to this specific community and beliefs and, and, you know, ideas about the way the world is and how humans are supposed to be and what God wants from us. And that creates like this very irreplicable, I think, intimacy with people right away. And that is such an antidote to loneliness, especially when you, you're in a new place and you don't know anyone. And I think if you've never experienced that firsthand, it's very hard to communicate to someone what that is like. And church is distinct from these other communal institutions and contexts where we would make friends and, and that we would have an antidote to loneliness in two important and closely related senses. One is there is that underlying foundation of shared belief and purpose. And like I have a, a friend, for instance, who is not a Christian, was in the past, he's deconverted, 
and he misses, he, he's aware of sort of like that positive communal sense. And, and we've talked about like how he wishes he could be a part of the church in that sense again, but he can't in an intellectually honest sense because he doesn't have the beliefs right now. And then closely related to that, the other sense is that those beliefs should have some effect of persuading us to stay even when we kind of don't feel like it right now. Whereas mm. these other institutions, you know, if you don't want to do your bowling league anymore, quit your bowling league. Who cares, right? Mm. There's not sort of that incentive to persevere through some, you know, apathy or burnout or, um, you know, some interpersonal conflict with someone in your group. And so how do you explain that to someone who's not experienced it firsthand? I think it's very tricky. And I think we're increasingly in this new situation of trying to make that case to people who have never been in any kind of religious community. And that is a, it's a hard thing to do because it's a totally foreign experience. Yeah, I think that we have a tendency to talk about the church as if it was an institution just like any other institution. You know, you use the language of advertising, I think, sort of tongue in cheek. But the idea yeah, that we <laughs> would need to market our, <laughs> I mean, I don't know you that well, but the idea that we might have to market ourselves as valuable to me is a product of where we exist in the West and the technological world. We think that good things have to be useful. And I actually think the church has to dial that back and say, you know, we have these goods that may not be marketable and may not be immediately useful to you, but we're mm. telling the truth about the world in a different way. The diagnosis in the essay and the diagnosis in terms of what the Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, has talked about, are they're spot on. It's undeniable we are in this moment where because of all these things we've talked about, all these contributors of the sort of social fabric breaking down, that loneliness is a problem and that loneliness is being weaponized by bad actors. So no doubt. I mean, it's a it's an intriguing article. It, re- it reminds you of why she's the figure that she is on the left uh, as, a, as an intellect and as someone who's been serious about policy on these things, even if oftentimes, personally anyway, I find myself in a different place when it comes to solutions. So... All right, with that said, let's talk more about the church here in just a moment. We'll be right back. Okay, so Bonnie, you wrote a column last week. I thought it was fantastic. It was the column I was hoping someone was going to write in response to actually another essay at The Atlantic. This one was written by Jake Meter. Jake is a contributor to Christianity Today as well. And the essay was on... I believe it was titled The Misunderstood Reason Millions of Americans Stopped Going to Church. And the essence of Jake's article was an argument he's making that says that the problem is not that the American church is asking too much of busy Christians, but that it's asking too little and that there is sort of too little on the table in terms of what meaningful membership, participation, and community, however you want to phrase that, is. You wrote a column last week responding in part to that, and the title of your essay was, What if Churches Ask for More and No One Says Yes? Can you talk to us a little bit about your column last week and what you were addressing in Metter's article? Yeah, so I thought it was a, his article was a great piece, very thought-provoking, and he's drawing on a forthcoming book about de-churching written by a trio of pastors. And so basically what he says is, you know, he acknowledges that there are lots of reasons that people sort of drop out of congregational life. But he says, what if a big one that we're really not talking about is just the way that modern American life is and the way it has us so tightly scheduled and with so many obligations. And he's particularly talking about people sort of in prime, like working and child rearing years where you have all of the stuff that the kids need to do, all of the stuff that you need to do. You're at soccer three nights a week. You know, you're at music lessons two nights a week. Everything is just scheduled and taken. Your time is all spoken for. And so then when Sunday morning comes around, you're just tired. And it's, you know, it's another thing on the to-do list. And gradually your attendance starts dropping off. And so his argument is it might seem like if that's the case, churches need to make it easy for attendance. You know, just like sort of make it a simple obligation to fulfill. And he says, but maybe that's thinking about it wrong and in fact backwards and what churches should be doing is asking more of people asking them to make this life together the most you know important piece of their lives and he's he's not asking for us to sort of like give church members more things to do though that inevitably ends up being part of it right but it's, it's really about being more to each other in community and 
I think that's all good and right, and I agree. But the question that came to me is, if you start doing this, will people actually say yes? And the reason why I'm hesitant to think that they will is that I think to say yes assumes that you have sort of the same underlying commitment to church as something that's not only good, but something that is extenuating circumstances aside, necessary to ordinary Christian life. And the reality, based on you know what people self-report, based on polling, based on there's a really interesting new study coming out where it, it looked at people's church attendance based on their cell phone location data and found that we're way over reporting how much we go to church when pollsters ask. But all this evidence points to most professing American Christians don't actually think about church that way anymore. They are much more of the ilk that you can be a faithful Christian without routine participation and investment in communal embodied church life. Kirsten, I think that gets kind of right at some things that you've written about and spoken about as well in terms of why church matters. I mean, that was your essay from earlier this year was titled Why Church is the Wrong Question. How do you think about this tension between people feeling like they don't have time for church and a church needing to ask for more or wanting to ask for more from people in terms of belonging? Yeah, I think what church gives us is the truth about the world, and it actually names our condition. We're talking a lot about how young families are exhausted and the economic demands of life are exhausting when we're so separate from family and community. And scripture tells us that too, you know, that we are deeply dependent, that we're finite and that we're in need of daily provision. And so in a certain kind of way, I feel like we have an opportunity as the church to tell people what they already know, right? That we're deeply dependent Our susceptibility to harm each other is at forefront of mind. Like we daily sin, we daily make mistakes and wrong each other. And being part of a church community isn't simply about do we ask more or ask less? It's about do we have one place in our week where we are reminded of who we are? And so our loneliness or exhaustion kind of gets, I hope, like filed away in this broader picture of you are the type of person who needs to rely daily upon what Christians call grace. I liked Jake's piece a lot. I think he's absolutely correct that our communities have become fragmented and that there is really interesting and important changes we could make socially that would allow communal life to be lived in a different way. I think one of the greatest challenges for Americans, though, is the way we believe our value is rooted in our outcomes. You know, we think that if we do the right things for our children and we get them into elite soccer or whatever else it is, that they're going to be, quote, successful and we'll have succeeded as parents. And so the church can give us a kind of narrative that says, you know what, we actually have this other set of things, charity, hospitality, forgiveness, all these other things that we think are ultimate. And it can allow you to uh, readjust your priorities, not by saying, I also need you to volunteer for vacation Bible school. But by saying, if you want to be a Christian, like Christianity has always been somewhat demanding. That's kind of the point. And it's part of what gets me fired up about the why church question, Mm -hmm. because if we're asking Christians to lay out our goods alongside everyone else's goods, ours are like kind of, they're like kind of tacky. It's like a lot of church basement guitar, sort of poor production value stuff. We don't have the flashy things on offer. What we do have is an invitation to this other form of life. That can ultimately free you from the anxiety, the competition, the sense of meaninglessness that will rob you of the day-to-day joy. But it doesn't ask more. It asks like everything, right? Mm -hmm. At least that's how I view it. Yeah, I had two thoughts strike me as I read it. The first one was, you know, he describes a character that I believe is actually a composite that comes from the book that he's looking at. It's this tired mom. She's always uh, tired. She's got a a baby at home. She's, she's always tired. She's always tired. And, and she's got a baby at home and not getting much sleep and all of this. And, and the day comes where, for whatever reason, she makes the choice, makes, takes the opportunity to skip church on a Sunday morning and, and get some extra sleep. And that gradually that sort of one-off thing becomes multiple times and then becomes a habit. And then the next thing you know, they're no longer going to church. And I thought what was interesting about that composite, particularly given Jake's argument, is to me, like that's where, when I've seen the church at its best and its most beautiful, is when the church is showing up for that mom. Those sort of crisis places of exhaustion and and all of that are 
are the very places where the church can, you know, to use a cliched phrase, like the church can be the church and support one another in community. At the same time, like the other thing that struck me reading the article is he cites the example of this intentional community of pacifist Christians that he encountered where the demand is very high and they do common purse and they do all of those kinds of things. And this is where, you know, I don't know if it's my cynicism that sort of comes to the surface here, but those stories just don't end well, usually. My concern with the piece is that it did strike me as dismissive of the extent to which scandal, fallen leadership, and abusive leadership has influenced this conversation, where Christians are looking at the church and they're going, man, I've seen ugly things. Um, I've experienced ugly things. I've listened to podcasts about have, ugly things. I've listened to podcasts about <laughs> ugly things. Guilty as charged. So how does the church how does the church become a place where trust can be rebuilt and restored given some of that context? I think that this is a somewhat unpopular take, but I feel like Christians of all people should be primed to expect other people to sin against them especially because our understanding of the role of what a pastor is and what a leader is. None of us are immune from daily confession and from receiving absolution and grace. And I think there's ways in which in American evangelicalism, leaders have been unchecked in part because what we've been trying to do is put on like a really great show. And often the times some of the people who put on really great shows maybe lack other sorts of, you know, qualities like humility or other things. But the idea that we might create a community that is immune from sin is a deeply unchristian ideal. The Christians should not ever think that's the goal because we of all people understand ourselves as those who are daily in need of grace. Somehow that doesn't translate to most people who think about church. I spend a lot of time with a lot of young adults, especially who've left the church and are kind of like on hold until they find one that's doing it right. And I hate to tell them this, but they're just probably never going to make it back if their ideal is like, let's just put the right systems in place so we don't harm each other. They basically want a community that's made of robots. I think our understanding of what it means to be a human has dripped so far down and been so influenced by technology that we think if we just get the right patch, like can we find the virus software that's going to prevent this form of abuse? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think that's wise. And on the subject of why people leave, you know, I wrote my first book about sort of differences within orthodoxy. And, and a lot of the basic idea was, you know, if, if you found yourself unable to sort of stick with, say, the doctrine of hell that you were raised with, well, there are other, like, still within the bounds of orthodoxy, there are other ways to understand hell. And here are some other ones. And so if that's what's driving you out the door, you should know about these other perspectives that faithful Orthodox Christians have held. You know, I think that that was a worthwhile endeavor and people have told me that that's been very useful for them and so on. But I also think that a lot of times we lie to ourselves about the reason that we're leaving a specific church or church in general, and that mm -hmm. it is frequently not these sort of very principled sounding things about, you know, our newfound theological differences or our deep concerns over sort of harmfulness writ large in the Christian community, and that it is often these more mundane things that Jake was writing about. And that a frequent tell is that it's not, I'm leaving this congregation where the pastor was corrupt, or I'm leaving this denomination where I no longer agree with their viewpoint on these three issues. Or maybe that's what we say, right? But then you don't go find another congregation with a pastor who's not corrupt. You don't mm -hmm. find another denomination that doesn't have those three beliefs. And so I think we frequently need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves and scrutinize ourselves a little more closely about why are we actually leaving? And these mundane reasons frequently are the underlying matter at hand. You know, as, as you were talking, Kirsten, what comes to mind to me when you talk about being a community that's a community marked by confession and absolution, that's great. When those are the practices that shape evangelical identity, that's awesome, right? Like, I'm all for that. I wrote a book about this. The question I would ask is, to what extent is evangelical life. When we really look at like the practices of the church, when the church gets together on a Sunday morning and they sing their songs and they listen to sermons and they're sent back home, how much have the dynamics of confession, assurance of pardon, passing the peace to one another, resolving conflict with one another, coming to the Lord's table as one body, 
how much of those are communicated to the people and how much is the pastor understood how much of the communication in terms of the structure of the liturgy, the architecture of the building, the way the thing goes, how much are we communicating? Oh, he also is one of us who needs to be participating in all of these same elements of the surface, confessing his sins, receiving absolution, you know, as everybody else. Because I think, unfortunately, like, I think we're far more marked by kind of a victorious Christian life culture on Sunday mornings. And the pastor, even in a church where you might attend this church where nobody knows the, you know, nobody knows this guy's name outside of the five mile radius. And yet the culture that's been built around his persona and who he is to those people mirrors a lot of the same kind of thing where he's the embodiment of a certain kind of Christian ideal. I think that's what makes it difficult. I don't dismiss the idea that, that a lot of people are leaving on false premises at all. As a pastor, I saw that all the time. But I also wonder to what extent the culture reflects those deeper theological values and deeper practices on a week-to-week basis. I do think it, we need to be less interested in our own sin than we are in the kind of grace that we receive and offer one to another. You know, some of the question that we're tempted towards is, I like your ideas. Do they work? And the do they work question is, again, it's an instrumental question. I'm a trained theologian. I've taken to saying that theologians are like plumbers, like you only need us when you need us. But when you need us, you really need us. And I do feel like the American church today is in a state where we could use some people who said, you know, are you doing the thing that you think you're doing? That's a really important and helpful question. And it's a good reason to discern in your own community. Like, are we a people marked by repentance? And you get to start with yourself there. You know who, Lord, would you have me forgive is a great place to start with that question. Not, oh, so-and-so senior leader seems to Mm. be holding a grudge. Like, kind of works the other way, typically. That's well put. All right. We will be right back. So earlier this week, FAA investigators released a report on a runway incident in Tulsa, Oklahoma from last year involved a FedEx plane that landed on the wrong runway on an overnight cargo flight. So you can imagine when a plane is landing and suddenly lands on the wrong runway, how truly disastrous this could be. And there have been you know horrific accidents as a result of this. There was an incident, I believe the year before that where a plane essentially landed on a taxiway because the pilots misidentified the runway. And the Transportation Safety Board identified fatigue as one of the primary causes of this particular incident. Fatigue is often cited as a concern with pilots. It's cited as a concern with truck drivers. Right now, there's actually a union dispute. This is union day on the bulletin. But there's a union dispute with the pilots from Virgin Atlantic where pilots are concerned about pilot fatigue as well related to how many hours they're expected to be on the clock per year, inside the calendar year. The deeper subject that is interesting about this and worth talking about on our show today is just the question of fatigue. Before we got rolling today, we were talking in our sort of virtual green room with with some of our producers and several people were saying, including me, yeah, summer's over and I'm exhausted. And it's almost like getting back just into the rhythm of school with our kids going back to school and everything else is going to be a chance to kind of reset. Kirsten, let me start with you. When you think about the questions of rest and fatigue, I'm sure in the minds of a lot of people who are listening, they're going, man, I don't need one more thing to do because I'm exhausted. How should Christians be thinking about the issue of fatigue and of rest? I think the way we work in the world and the way we relate even to our own devices makes us think, oh, if I just plug it in, it'll like recharge and I can then work again. But God's called us in our rest to acknowledge our dependence upon God and to make sure that our lives and our habits and our rhythms are marked by that dependence. That's the point of Sabbath, right? This tabernacle in time idea. But it's marked also by our schedules, by the demands we make on our children and our spouses, by whether we allow ourselves like to eat a meal or recreate. When you can start to think about your rest as being an acknowledgement of your dependence upon God, it helps you prioritize it, right? Because it's in that rest, you're telling the truth about who you are. Mm. It's in all the striving and all the adding and even the adding that the churches do. Like maybe if I add this program, it'll fix everything. 
rest reminds us that we are made, right? And that being made puts us in a relation of dependence to God. Bonnie, do you think we live in a time that is uniquely exhausting? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, obviously my life is much easier than like, you know, turn of the 20th century factory worker who works 12 hours a day, six days a week, right? Like my tiredness is nowhere near that person's tiredness and never will be. On the other hand, I do think that we have sort of, a, and it's a, it's a post-industrial revolution thing where everything is so tightly scheduled. We operate by clocks now in a way that we didn't in times past. And that allows us to parcel it every minute and have every bit of our time spoken for. And rest becomes something that we have to schedule along with everything else. And something that frequently when your schedule gets too full, that's where you, you know, cut. And so I think that and the way that we now all, you know, carry our phones and are more conscious of time and its passage than ever before. I mean, even thinking back 20 years ago, not everybody wore a watch. You know, we were not as precise as we are now. I think that new increasingly systematized relationship to time adds to our sense of tiredness and our sense of constant obligation and things always being spoken for. And it also perhaps lets us feel that it's excusable when we have a few minutes that aren't spoken for to sort of fritter them away in a way that is not really restful. But again, it's, it's a different kind of exhaustion than, than people in other times and places have experienced. And so to say like it's unique, kind of. But again, the, the factory worker's life was much harder than mine is. I think I agree with that, with the caveat that I think the information environment is so mm -hmm. different, that there's a, there's, there's a different kind of relentlessness. It's a mental exhaustion, I think, more than a physical exhaustion. It's just content blasting in your face all day long. And I think there's a pressure to have an opinion about things Certainly, that is also yeah. exhausting. Yeah, the, the quote that came to mind when I first came across this story this week is, it's from a story the poet David White tells in a talk he gave. Where he talks about this conversation he had with a friend of his who's a Benedictine monk, and and he was exhausted. He said at the time he was working for a, a nonprofit, and his friend said, the antidote to exhaustion isn't rest, it's wholeheartedness. It's a profound thought when you start to think about what it is that does exhaust us, the information environment, the need to respond to things we don't care about, or we feel like we should care about and, and are sort of outside of our control or our expertise or our influence and interest and all the rest. Or, you know, to some of the things we were talking about earlier, the fact that we often feel tethered to things that we're doing for our family or for our work or for whatever, for reasons that are very externalized and maybe not essential to what it means to be a thriving human being, right? I think about it a ton. And I think it's something that I've noticed in myself as well, that when the summer comes and it's like, okay, summer's here, we're going to rest, we're going to unplug, we're going to do whatever. Oftentimes you do come to the end of the summer like we did today and go, man, I'm exhausted. Like we did a lot. We, this was a great summer. We had great vacations as a family, but boy, are we tired on the heels of it. And it's almost like just the rhythms of having to get back to school and ordinary routines feel inviting because it's stabilizing in a certain way. Okay. Before we wrap up here, let me ask you this then as two people who are very thoughtful, I want to ask related to exhaustion and wasting time. What wastes your time? Is it an app? Is it a social media platform? What's the rabbit hole you get sucked down and go, man, I can't believe I just spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Start with you, Bonnie. Sure. Yeah. I'll go first. Embarrass myself first. Right now, it is looking at extremely high-end classic English kitchen designs on Instagram. <laughs> um, that I super cannot afford, it's but so they are specific. so beautiful. And like, I'm getting, I'm getting into details now of like, what if the cabinet doors do not overlap the cabinet? Like they're not sort of set on the outside of the cabinet, but what inset if they are doors. inset? And it, it is so much more beautiful. And I want that now. Um, so it is a big exercise in probably like borderline sinful envy, but also just like appreciation of like the craftsmanship and the materials and the thought that people put into this stuff. And now Instagram serves me ads for extremely wealthy people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've probably overused Instagram to a certain point. I also, Substack notes, I got off Twitter about two years ago and then now I'm on Substack and... Hmm. 
there's just so many interesting things you can, as a writer, you can read other people's writing all day long and have opinions about it and never get around to doing your own writing. So I have to be careful that I don't read too much. That is so much smarter sounding than mine. <laughs> it's really not. I don't think it's any better though, in terms of the end product, right? Well, I promise you, Bonnie, I will make you sound much smarter because mine, <laughs> my Instagram algorithm is almost exclusively, there's some on knife sharpening, All right. which I don't know how that happened, but I watched a bunch of knife sharpening videos a couple of years ago on Instagram, and now I get a billion of them. <laughs> but the vast majority of it is either stand-up comedians doing crowd work <laughs> or fail videos. Lots of like yeah, motorbike, <laughs> uh, BMX accidents, surfing accidents. Mm. It's it's bad. And I can very easily – I have a friend who I'm always texting these things to. It's like, and he's like, I can tell when it's a writing day for you because you're texting me all day long not writing. Thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> probably a bad sign. All right. Well, Bonnie and Kirsten, thank you so much for joining us this week on The Bulletin. And thanks to all of you for listening. And we will see you next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. Our executive producer is Eric Petrick. Our producers are Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Our associate producer is Azure Phelps. Editing and mixing by TJ Hester. Music by Dan Phelps. Show design by Brian Todd. Graphic design by Amy Jones. Social media by Kate Lucky.